My name is Suresh. I'm from Northwestern University in Chicago. And what is so cool about this session is that we're going to talk about our worst nightmares. And I'm sure each and every one of you can associate yourself with some of these things and said, I think I had this a few years ago. Or maybe I had this last week. So uh, we have three amazing speakers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, introduce each one of them separately uh, as they head to the podium. Our first speaker is my good friend, Nicola Disma. And congratulations to Nicola. I've been working with him on the pediatric track, so it's been an absolute pleasure working with Nicola. He's a senior consultant pediatric anesthetist, professor and head of research at Institute Giannini Gasolini in Italy, in Genoa, and he is perhaps, you know, what I credit him with is every time he comes up with a large collaborative study, it is another fruit. So I'm looking forward to the next fruit that he might have. But he is going to be talking about uh, his worst nightmares in pediatric airway. A uh, couple quick notes for you. You will be able to put in questions. I think I get it on this iPad, and we'd be able to discuss these questions at the end of the day. So feel free to write in your questions as he's speaking or as you think it's best. OK, and thank you, Nicola. So thank you very much again. It's me again in the podium. Thank you very much, Suresh, for your very kind introduction. Um, I'm glad to see that the room is full of people. It means that pediatric anesthesia is of great interest. We have a lot of things to discuss. And today, I'm going to present the worst nightmare, which means that um, uh, sometimes we have to reflect on our errors. And we can always learn from our errors if we are able to discuss all together and to do uh, better things next time. OK, this one will be on. Uh, highway management. I do not have conflict of interest to share. So basically, what I'm going to present in the next 10 minutes, it's a very rare syndrome. I work in a tertiary level children's hospital in Italy, and we deal with rare syndromes. Uh, let's say a couple of years ago, because this is already a frequent flyers uh, patient in my hospital, I've been called by one of my residents that said, OK, Dr. Disma, we have a child uh, with a Melnick needle syndrome. Of course, you know what it is. I said, of course, I have plenty of experience. And then I discovered that there are like, there are like 20 cases all around the world. I said, OK, it's interesting. What is this syndrome? It's a rare genetic disorder, um, mainly affecting the, the skeletal development. Uh, He's characterized by this exophthalmus, prominent forehead, mandibular hypoplasia, recognizia. Uh, they also have dental problems. Uh, they have prominent bones. And they might have some, sometimes also cardiorespiratory and renal issues related to the syndrome by itself. So basically, this is one of the x-ray we took to this child. Polymalformative syndrome, mainly related to the development of the, of the bones. And they also have chest and spine deformities. They usually have bronchospasms. But what is really important is that they are affected by obstructive sleep ap apnea. So as I told you, this is a let's say, frequent flyer in our hospital, because this child already had several surgeries and, of course, anesthesia. He started when he was one with cleft palate, uh, uh, glossopexia, and then he had, she had, actually, um, uh, retropharyngeal uh, lipofilling, uh, and then he had uh, surgery for scoliosis. Uh, anyway, a lot of these muscle skeletal uh, uh, repairs. So basically, I went back to the uh, other anesthesia which were provided. And I read, interestingly, that two years before coming again for this anesthesia, the child had sevoflurane induction. He was kept in spontaneous breathing, topical anesthesia, 
nasotracheal intubation, and then he was transferred to the to the ICU, and it was extubated in, let's say, protected environment, which is the PICU in, a, in my hospital. Uh, it's okay, everything was uneventful. But one year back, he came back to the operating room for another lower limb surgery, and the anesthetist, which was not me, performed a similar, let's say, similar anesthesia to the previous one, sevofluorine induction, maintained spontaneous breathing, then they tried to insert the LMA for a fiber optic intubation, but the LMA was difficult to insert, and this child had an acute and massive bleeding from the hypertrophic tonsils and adenoids, so the um, surgery was canceled, and he, the child was awakened from anesthesia, and of course, they rescheduled anesthesia and, say, and surgery later on. So even if applying the very same anesthesia seems to be not very ex effective as it was one year before. So then before performing the next anesthesia, we summarized more or less which is the situation of this child. So uh, LMA was easy to insert when he was younger, but then he became difficult to insert at later ages. Uh, he has complete, she has complete uh, neck, uh, uh, blocked by the scoliosis surgery, so it's not possible to extend or to turn the, the head. He, she has a Cormac 4 lehen, uh, maybe some improvement with, with laryngoscopy, fiber optic, we don't know because when we tried to attempt the fiber optic intubation, one time was successful, the other one was impossible. And of course, as you remember, during the last anesthesia, the child had this acute and severe bleeding from the adenoids, which made the anesthesia impossible and the child was awakened. So I said, oh my God, what should I need to do today? So basically, the today presentation is now the child is eight years, 30 kilos, micrognathia, small mouth opening, full neck rigidity, no head movements at all, scoliosis, exophthalmia, and then the child is under nocturnal uh, non-invasive ventilation due to the uh, severe sleep apnea syndrome. So, and he also had um, obstructive lung disease, uh, which is treated with uh, non-invasive ventilation, nocturnal non-invasive ventilation. And this is the feature of the child, the day of, of anesthesia. So, what we decided uh, with the team is to perform uh, an anesthesia uh, with an IV line already in place. So, we put an MLA cream, we put the line, and we started with some propofol and fentanyl and atropine to reduce secretion. Then we did topical anesthesia. This was actually the plan, and we thought to, to do face mask ventilation in spontaneous breathing to facilitate oxygenation under TIVA, because after you start anesthesia, there was no longer possible to administer sevofluran. And the plan was, uh, of course, to perform fiber optic intubation through the face mask, not LMA due to the acute bleeding, and the extubation in PICU. What happened? Actually, we did the first attempt, uh, fiber optic via uh, face mask, the child had marginal oxygenation, not easy to ventilate despite the spontaneous breathing. Uh, then we did a second attempt, uh, always through the face mask, uh, and in the meantime we called for ESTVELP and the uh, ENT surgeon came to the operating room. We always said this marginal oxygenation, difficult to maintain oxygenation within the range of safety. Then we performed a third attempt performed by the ENT surgeon, so there was an advance that in expertise, if the ENT is, is a surgeon is a real expert, but I can say that my hospital are really good experts in performing fiber optic, but fiber optic via the face mask was impossible uh, due to the complete collapse of the pharynx. Then the fourth attempt was performed with a combination of techniques. So basically what we did was we were able to insert the hyperangulated blade into the mount via the laryngoscopy and uh, with fiber optic, so combined technique uh, with laryngoscopy, fiber optic, at the end intubation was successful. So basically this is the grid which is between three and four and we use the hyperangulated blade with video laryngoscopy. We combine the technique using uh, uh, fiber optic. So what do we learn from this case? Actually, these are my personal 
uh, learning points, then we can discuss. Of course, this syndrome, uh, despite you don't know which kind of a syndrome it is, because it's very rare, so we don't need to learn how to manage anesthesia in this specific child, but we need to remind ourselves that there are some syndromes that might improve with ages, and some other syndromes which might worsen with age, and I have to admit that I added the Melnick uh, needle syndrome after this case. So this is one of those uh, where uh, the later the age, the more complicated the airway became. Second point, I came back to the, to the um, uh, algorithm, let's say the visual aids we, we publish in the BJA and DJ with the guidelines, which reminds me that it's really important to have help read the available and to have a plan B, maybe also plan C in mind. Uh, it's important that we limit the number of attempts, so we perform four attempts. I know it's quite limited, but the good part is that we advance at any times in technique or expertise at any attempts. So any times you are doing something, you have to think about what to do next if you are in a wrong situation. Uh, it's important that we think that all the techniques that cannot be considered se separately, but sometimes we have to combine these techniques, and this is exactly the aim of these visual aids. So the three techniques are not independent techniques, but they might be combined with each other. In this case, we combine the VL with the fiber optic. And of course, this is also uh, what is represented in the flow chart. So what basically is guiding you at every attempt is the clinical situation of the child. So the saturation, they're able to ventilate it, to maintain the physiological parameter within a range of, let's say, normality is extremely important, which guides you to do what to do next. So it's, it's not yourself, it's of course the, your competence, but you have to watch the patient and you have to understand how stable it is and if we can progress to other technique or if we have to stop and come back to uh, another technique or maybe again postpone the surgery. Uh, it's important that we prevent difficult face mask ventilation. Actually, there are new data from the PEDI registry, and we wrote a nice editorial. Uh, and I think this is really important because uh, difficult face mask ventilation, and this is one of the case, might trigger a cascade of events that might bring you to the cannot oxygenate, cannot ventilate scenario. So it's important that we prevent uh, this kind of this difficulty, and there are certain, this is again, these are data from the PEDI registry, I don't expect you to go through the table, but the message is that uh, awake intubation in children is not performed, I mean, it was performed on a routine basis in neonates, it's never performed by an ECD. I hope this technique is abandoned, but, there is always a but, there are certain conditions where you have to think about uh, how to keep the child in spontaneous breathing, and if it's possible to minimize the, um, uh, the administration of sedatives in order to keep ventilation spontaneous to maintain oxygenation within a range of, let's say, nearly normal. So these are rare cases, but sometimes in very few and selected cases, an awake or nearly awake intubation might save the life of the child. Finally, this is again the uh, visual abstract of the uh, guidelines, which you can easily download. Just to summarize, it's important that you identify the case and you go through the medical history, but don't trust what has been done during the last anesthesia, because as I told you, some syndromes might improve, some others some be, some, uh, might worse through the time, so they are not, I mean, syn syndromes evolve with age. The second is anesthesia and paralysis is recommended by the uh, guidelines, but of course there are always exceptions. So uh, read carefully the guidelines and apply to every single case because not all children are the same. And finally, extubation is it's also important uh, and it's never an emergency situation. So plan your extubation where the safest place it is in your hospital. If it is EICU or uh, uh, operating room, doesn't matter, but bring the child and extubate in the safest period of the day and in the safest environment. In conclusion, 
medical history is important, but as I told you, some syndromes might evolve. Previous anesthesia management cannot work uh, the current day of anesthesia. Uh, consider spontaneous breathing if it might help in preventing the risk of can uh, oxygenate, can intubate. Uh, limit the number of attempts. This is always a gold rule. Uh, advancing technique by each attempt doesn't mean that you have to change the device, but you can also advance in expertise or medication or, or other stuff. And the combined techniques are becoming even more popular because they might help in very selected case. And with this, I thank you very much, and I remind you again that you are welcome to join the cricket study. Uh, the call for center is still open. If you are doing pediatric anesthesia, you are welcome to join with this site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Aruna Sundaram. Uh, she's the head of anesthesiology at Sri Ramachandra Medical Co College in Chennai in India. Um, she's an expert anesthesiologist. I had the opportunity to have seen her in action. And quite frankly, this is something I'm looking forward to seeing some of her experiences. So she'll be talking about massive intraoperative bleeding. Uh, how do we manage this? And as I said, the idea here is for experts here to give their opinion about some difficult case, but we would certainly welcome your feedback and also your questions. I'm already getting a bunch of questions on my iPad, so please continue to send your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you, Dr. Suresh, for that kind introduction. We move on from one nightmare to the next nightmare, massive intraoperative bleeding. What happened was we had a five-year-old child weighing 20 kgs with a preoperative hemoglobin of nine grams per deciliter for a laparoscopic pyeloplasty under general anesthesia. In the middle of the surgery, there was an injury to the internal iliac vein. The surgery was being done by a junior consultant and a resident. So what are our thoughts at this point of time? When you have an unanticipated intraoperative massive hemorrhage, or code red, it's one of the most challenging situations for an anesthesiologist, because 12% of such patients can have a cardiac arrest because of the hypovolemia of the blood loss. So the thoughts that went through our mind was, the first thing is, I have insufficient venous access. I just have one 22-gauge cannula on this child. I don't think my monitoring is enough now, because I only had an ECG, a non-invasive blood pressure, pulse oximeter, and ETCO2. Now I definitely want an arterial line. This child did not have any cross-matched blood reserved. So there, is, there can be a lack of timely supply of blood and blood products. The senior surgeon had to come from the next block, so there's going to be a lack of timely control of the bleeding. All this can lead on to a coagulopathy, and we can have complications of hypoperfusion, so we were very worried that we should not have any morbidity or mo mortality on this child. So what is essential now is appropriate management as well as timely management becomes very crucial. What exactly is massive intraoperative bleeding in a child? So when we look at definitions, there are more than 10 definitions like this in different publications. But what is practically useful is going to be a 50 ml, 50% 50 of blood volume, if it gets replaced every hour, or if we have to give 40 ml per kg of blood every hour, then we can consider it as a massive hemorrhage. So this can vary anywhere between 140 ml for a term neonate to 800 ml for our five-year-old child, to 2,100 ml, and our loss was already crossing one liter. So it classified, it did classify as a massive hemorrhage. So the management options are, the surgeon is going to arrest the surg surgical bleeding, we have to take care of oxygenation, perfusion, and we have to remember that we have to take care of hemostatic resuscitation, which means multiple things have to be done simultaneously by us now. The first and foremost is to assess the degree of shock. Generally, children do not hypotense till more than 45% of the blood volume is lost. And in grade 4 hemorrhagic shock, 
it is likely that they develop blood failure. Blood now is considered as an organ composed of blood cell, plasma, and endothelium. And in grade four hemorrhagic shock, we can have blood failure manifesting as not just a fall in hemoglobin alone, but a fall in fibrinogen, an increase in prothrombin time, a fall in platelet count, and also as a metabolic acidosis. So what do we do to prevent the child from getting into a coagulopathy now? The first is, of course, we called for help. We need more team members now. We need more surgeons, more anesthesiologists, nurses, people from the blood bank. We have to send immediately for grouping and cross-matching. That's what we did. And the second thing is we gave a bolus of 20 ml per kg of a balanced crystalloid. We used plasma light. We can also use ringolactate. We had to insert additional cannula, so it is always useful to find out where our child has its veins and also use ultrasound and remember that shorter, wider cannulas are better. So this is what we did. We inserted a 20-gauge cannula into this child in addition to the 22-gauge the child had. We wanted to upgrade the monitoring, so we also put in an arterial line in the radial artery. We also got a central line inserted in the right internal jugular vein. And we were maintaining perfusion pressure using inotropes and vasopressors, and we started sending ABG and labs, and we also have a thrombelastography, so we went to, sent a TEG to look at the coagulation profile, electrolytes, lactates, base deficit, and the hemoglobin. One thing which was on our mind is we want to avoid the lethal triad. We didn't want hypothermia, we didn't want acidosis, we didn't want coagulopathy. So we avoided too much of crystalloid resuscitation and we avoided using isotonic saline because too much of normal saline can result in a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and we wanted to get blood and blood products early. So hemostatic resuscitation is always recommended when more than 50% of the blood volume is lost, where we add yellow blood in addition to the red blood, which means we get on board fresh frozen plasma, platelet concentrates, and cryoprecipitate in addition to packed red blood cells. So in an actively bleeding patient like this, what does the expert recommendation say? It says just go ahead with massive transfusion protocol and do not wait for any test. So as per this, we gave a bolus. We got uncross-matched O-negative packed red blood cells from the blood bank, which was we could get it within just 10 to 15 minutes, and gave a bolus of 20 to 30 ml per kg. But if this is not going to, uh, if the bleeding is not going to stop, then we were thinking we will go ahead with one is to one is to one ratio of packed red blood cell, fresh frozen plasma, and platelet concentrates. So the similar value, weight-based dosing will be 20 ml per kg of packed red blood cells, 10 ml per kg of fresh frozen plasma, and 5 ml per kg of platelet concentrates. Platelet, uh, the plasma has to be uncross-matched AB plasma and all products through a 140 micron blood filter. And this had to be continued till bleeding could be controlled. So this is actually a ratio-driven balanced trans, uh, resuscitation strategy that is actually extrapolated from adult trauma and it is part of hemostatic resuscitation. So this is based on literature support. So this is a study which looked at five level one pediatric trauma centers where they have shown that a ratio of packed red blood cell to fresh frozen plasma of one is to one or more is found to be having a survival benefit. Similarly, there are several more retrospective studies, prospective studies, meta-analysis, all of which support the use of early plasma, red blood cell, packed red blood cell to plasma in a one is to one ratio whenever there is going to be massive pediatric hemorrhage. The next thing is we had to activate the massive transfusion protocol. This is a protocol This makes sure that blood products are sent in an immediate as well as sustained fashion in a set ratio from the blood bank to the operating room so that we can prevent the coagulopathy. So a pediatric specific massive transfusion protocol has to be there in the hospital to ensure delivery of blood products. So one such protocol which is available as a weight-based protocol where initially the blood bank just releases packed cells 20 to 30 ml per kg. If the bleeding is not controlled, then they also add fresh frozen plasma and uh, platelet concentrates. If it's still not getting control, you might also have to add cryoprecipitate as a source of fibrinogen. So in addition to giving blood and blood products like this, we also have to remember that we need to look at the complete blood count, the ABG, lactate, electrolytes, and coagulation. How frequently do we do this? We usually do it once every 30 minutes during the bleeding, or we do it whenever we have finished 
giving 40 ml per kg of blood products. So I would just like to recapitulate the seven T's of a massive transfusion protocol, which is very useful to remember in such a situation. The first T stands for trigger. So is it necessary to trigger the massive transfusion protocol? It depends upon the specific hospital criteria. The next T is to get the team in situ, the, all the team members to work towards the protocol. The third is tranexamic acid. So this is recommended. So we did give a bolus of 30 milligram per kg of tranexamic acid to this child because this has been shown to be useful in massive hemorrhage. The fourth T is the testing. So we were regularly sending complete blood count, ABGs, coagulation profiles to the lab, and a thrombelastography. We were transfusing on weight-based guidelines. The other thing is we need to make sure we have to avoid hypothermia, hypocalcemia, and hyperkalemia. We did this by monitoring temperature and using convective forced air warmers as well as fluid warmers. And for hyperkalemia, we were asking for blood which was less than seven days old, especially in children less than one year and less than 10 kg. It is recommended to use fresh blood, which is less than seven days old, or use washed blood and use larger catheters for transfusion. And to prevent hypocalcemia, we did use intravenous calcium gluconate for this baby. And we terminated this only when the bleeding was controlled, hemodynamics were stabilized, vasopressors could be reduced, and the transfusion was slowed. Another thing which is advocated is early cryoprecipitate. In this child, we did not use cryoprecipitate, but if the bleeding is going to persist, it's uh, believed that early cryoprecipitate actually is useful because it is a very good source of fibrinogen, and fibrinogen falls early in uh, massively hemorrhaging children. And when you look at the different sources by which you can get the fibrinogen, the two best options are probably to get the cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate. Cryoprecipitate packs just 250 milligrams within 20 ml. So without a volume overload, it is possible to give. But fibrinogen concentrate would be a better option. I think cryoprecipitate is not available in most places in Europe. So there are studies now which have shown that earlier administration of cryoprecipitate, just like earlier administration of fresh frozen plasma, lowers the mortality in a massively hemorrhaging child. So factor concentrates, these are the commonly used factor concentrates of which most of the literature is there for fibrinogen concentrate. This is very comfortable because this is available in the pharmacy as a powder, and you just have to reconstitute it. So availability is quite easy for fibrinogen concentrate, and it does not carry the infectious and immunological risk which is associated with blood products otherwise. Regarding prothrombin complex concentrate and recombinant factor 7A, uh, it may be useful, it is not very clear whether it will be useful in a massively bleeding child. So we did not use any of these products in our child. Fresh whole blood. This is again re-emerging in the treatment of massive transfusion because it's just one product for everything. It can address the oxygen debt, it can address the endotheliopathy, it can address the coagulopathy. But the main problem is when we use whole blood, especially from an O-negative donor, the anti-A, anti-B antibodies will be there in the plasma. So what is emerging now is low, tighter group O whole blood is what is being recommended for injured children. But we did not use this, but this is a thought. You can use low, tighter group O whole blood as well for injured children requiring massive transfusion. Regarding the role of viscoelastic assays, some places have thrombelastography, some places have rotation thrombelastometry. What we have is a thrombelastography. So the advantages of using viscoelastic assays is to avoid unnecessary overtransfusion. So instead of giving a fixed ratio of blood and blood products as one is to one is to one, we can tailor the treatment and make it individualized if we have results from the thrombelastography. So the therapeutic targets which we had was a hemoglobin of 8 grams per deciliter because a hemoglobin, a restrictive transfusion threshold is all right even in a hemorrhaging child. So 8 grams is acceptable. Fibrinogen has to be at least 100 milligram per deciliter. Prothrombin time less than 1.5. Platelet count more than 75,000. We were targeting a normal blood gas and a normal physiology and normal clinical parameters. So. We, it's important to remember that every 10 ml per kg of packed red blood cell will increase the hemoglobin by 2 grams per deciliter. Every 5 ml per kg of cryoprecipitate will increase the fibrinogen by 30 mg per deciliter. Every 10 ml per kg of fresh frozen plasma increases the coagulation by 20%. Every 10 ml per kg of afferous platelets increases the platelets by 50,000. 
And for a normal arterial blood gas, our targets are going to be having a lactate less than 4, a base deficit less than minus 6, a normal pH, a normal ionized calcium, and a normal potassium. And very, very important is the normal clinical picture, where the child has stable hemodynamics, normothermia, normal urine output, normal intravascular vol volume, and normal regional oximetry. And all this can be achieved by giving aliquots of packed red blood cells as 20 ml per kg and reevaluate ffp at 10 ml per kg platelets at 10 ml per kg and reevaluate cryo at 5 ml per kg and reevaluate so it, it goes into continuous assessment and treatment so do we have any consensus statement most of the uh, treatment for massive hemorrhagic shock the recommendations are from pediatric trauma and now we also have it from the Society for Advancement of Blood Management. So what we did was, what is in the recommendation? We tried to limit crystalloids. We tried to give blood and blood products early. We used a viscoelastic assay, but it is also OK if we do not have access to viscoelastic assay, then we can give the fixed ratio transfusion. We gave tranexamic acid. We activated the massive transfusion protocol. What we didn't use was a cell salvage, but that is an option. And the most important thing was to use physiological parameters to guide transfusion and not simply a hemoglobin value and use restrictive transfusion thresholds. One thing we did realize was using simulation would really help because this is a very uncommon event. It requires multidisciplinary coordination, teamwork, and communication. Suddenly, you have to mobilize resources and ensure timely management. It is very chaotic, and it is provider-dependent, and that can lead to compromised patient care. So learning through simulation in such a situation would really help in ensuring a very coordinated response with no morbidity and mortality. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aruna. Uh, our last speaker uh, is uh, my good friend, Thomas Engelhardt. He's the anesthetist in chief at McGill University in Montreal. So she had a patient who bled a lot and now is hypotensive. Can you help us out? <laughs> well, um, thank you very much. And uh, when I first got asked, thank you very much, Suresh, for a fantastic invitation and uh, introduction. And uh, great to be here to see so many colleagues and friends uh, from around the world. Uh, if I'm a bit slow then that's, or a bit uh, tardy, that's probably because I'm about it's about 4 o'clock in the morning, so I need to try to wake up, and hopefully it will happen over the next 50 minutes. So when I got first asked about this one, um, about the worst nightmare in the uh, operating room, saying, OK, what is it? I'm hypertension you want to talk to me about? Saying, what the heck, um, I don't really have nightmares. When I do have a nightmare, actually what I try to do, I prevent or fix the problem in the first place. And this particular moment when it comes down to hypotension doesn't really mean fixing the problem, switching the alarms off. That's a bad thing to do. So what you really want to do, you want to think why is there a problem in the first place. And the uh, second one I'm going to do is I'm going to present a near real case of a colleague rather than mine, because as I said, I don't really have the nightmares. And so far, I've been lucky to avoid these complete nightmares itself. And ultimately, is I do not pretend to be a pediatric cardiac anesthetist. And the reason why I'm saying this is if you actually meet one of those ones, and I have a lot of uh, friends who are pediatric cardiac anesthetists, they can talk for hours about physiology. And uh, I usually fall asleep, and I just uh, get sometimes distracted. So that's uh, from the introduction. So a case to start with, just to kick it off. Um, well, there's a two-month-old boy, baby boy, four and a half kilos, scheduled for a hernia repair. That's a positive family history. So what positive family history do you mean? All right, OK, yeah, he had an older sibling who was in a major tertiary center who had cardiac surgery. And unfortunately, this kid died after the cardiac surgery. OK, fine. And, uh, but OK, so maybe we should do an echo. We did an echo as a mild or the gradient clear cut cardiology. Yeah, don't worry. Everything is going to be fine. OK, so the plan is straightforward, a bit of SIBO, caudal. I'm an old guy. I don't do these regional and other regional techniques all the time. Uh, standard anesthesia monitoring and voila, go, go for it. Initial blood pressure, 68, 43, normal after 10 minutes. It starts to drop. Measure again, starts to drop. OK, what am I going to do? Volume, pressure, vasopressors, 
Anything else? Well, the thing with blood pressure is it's not really what we want to know, to be honest. What we really want to know is well hidden below. What we want to know is what is actually the oxygen delivery and what is the relationship between the two. And when it comes down to oxygen delivery, as you know, oxygen delivery is the uh, product of cardiac output times the oxygen content. And uh, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume, basic physiology. And uh, the, car uh, the oxygen content is effectively determined by, as you heard before, by the hemoglobin concentration and the oxygen uh, saturation. Further, make it more complicated. Again, basic physiology, preload, afterload, as well as inotropy. Uh, the cardiac function will determine how your stroke volume is uh, coming through. So blood pressure, as you know, physics, cardiac output times uh, systemic vascular resistance. You assume that the systemic vascular resistance remains the same. I told you that I've given some seroflurane as well as uh, a cordial anesthesia. So we're already dropping the systemic vascular resistance. So it's already a very fluid system. And then you add in all some more in there. So your blood volume changes, your blood viscosity changes, your vessel wall elasticity changes. So it's a different whether you have a very stiff system or a very uh, elastic system available. So, and so we have a, even though you say that blood pressure is the product of flow and resistance, the blood pressure in relation to the end organ perfusion or the hyperperfusion of what you really want to know isn't really measured. So is blood pressure really what we want to know? And again, just to put a more spanner into this one, into the hypertension, uh, the physiological blood pressure range for individual, for each individual, depends on the, well, individual patient itself. So for me, it's different to Suresh, to uh, Nicola, and anyone else in the room. And so uh, the same applies to the children that you uh, take care for. And the other thing that one organ that really take most pride and to try to protect at all times is the brain. But again, there is a huge unknown variability for each patient what uh, is safe to uh, safeguard your organ perfusion and your oxygen delivery to your brain. And again, the risk of hyperperfusion that leads ultimately to the permanent injury in your routine general anesthesia itself we don't know. So it's a big problem with hypotension, right? What we do know, however, is, and that is a courtesy of the nectarine studies and Suresh lights all the fruits, is the triad of doom. That means hypotension, hypoxemia, and anemia. If you have those three together in your child, leads to increased morbidity and mortality. And hypotension, hypoxemia, and anemia means oxygen delivery. Just, it's not the blood pressure that really counts. It's the oxygen delivery at all times. So. What's the normal blood pressure? And uh, there are many normograms around, and this one, I think, is from pediatrics in 1987, measured in over 70,000 healthy children. And you know, the normograms are available. You know that the blood pressure increases with age, and uh, larger children and obese children have uh, higher blood pressure. If you zoom in into the first year of life, again, you see an adaptation within the first three months, roughly. And uh, again, until it stabilizes. And if you zoom in further into your neonates, again, you see it's pretty stable, but a fairly decent blood pressure that we normally don't necessarily see in uh, pediatric anesthesia. So do we have reference values for non-invasive blood pressure in pediatric populations under general anesthesia? And there are uh, three studies about eight years coming out. One is from Rotterdam, one from Auckland, and one is a multi center uh, retrospective observation study looking at all the electronic records. Uh, unfortunately, in Montreal don't have those ones. Is uh, effectively looking at more than 110,000 uh, uh, cases from 10 centers. And yes, we can uh, produce some beautiful nomograms. And then it's saying they are pretty low compared to what we expect from the nomograms that I've shown you before, just to overlay them. So, and again, how do you define hypotension? Is hypotension really important? Well, as I said to you before, there's no real evidence or no real consensus de definition. For premies, most of the pediatric anesthetists will tell you, or anything like in, in the first two, three months of life, Effectively, the minimum value is the mean arterial pressure uh, is equivalent to gestation age. So if you have a 40-week uh, old gestation age, you aim for mean arterial pressure about 40. And most of us, and I'll come back to that in a minute as well, will say a 20 to 30% drop 
uh, is considered where we need to do something about it. So, PALS more recently, rather than the old uh, nomograms from the uh, for almost 40 years ago, it gives you a different definition as well. So, term neonate less than 60, infant 70, children 1 to 7, uh, 70 plus two times the age, and so on and so forth. And if you overlay them uh, to the nomograms that uh, was uh, published from the uh, multicenter study, you can see that actually in the older age group, two onwards, we are doing okay, but we are probably uh, far too low in the very, very young. And again, uh, um, triad of doom, hypoxia, anemia, and hypertension, we need to be very much like, careful. So. What do, when you actually ask pediatric anesthetists, what do you think about the hypertension? So we, there's one study which was published about 15 years ago and uh, asked uh, very experienced pediatric anesthetists on two sides of the Atlantic between the SPA, the Society of Pediatric Anesthesia, the North American part, and the British one, that's where I used to uh, practice for uh, half of my life in, in the UK. And uh, you can see that the definition is very, very, scary to be honest. On the left hand side you can see this uh, very small, not the box of visca blood, you can see uh, the blood pressure where we should be compared to what pediatric anesthetists actually accept. And the scary bit is that, a, well okay, I, I'm, I can say I trained in the UK, so the APA I'm happy that we are a little bit higher, but I don't think even those values are still good enough as yet. So does it matter? Most of the times, I think we're getting away, but sometimes we do not. And I would like to draw attention to this uh, case series started by Boston from Marielle McCann, and uh, who published a case series of, of normal um, uh, intraoperative anesthesia management with devastating consequences and effectively infarcts in your, in your brain in the watershed areas with uh, persistent and uh, long-lasting neurological morbidity. So, going back, when you said 20% um, drop in your blood pressure to a baseline, okay, um, that's what most people say. And then if you look at this one, the one scary thing here is, I can't really just highlight it on, on, on the slides, is that some people don't really seem to care at all. So you have a decrease of 30, 40%, and more than 40%. So one in five people don't really monitor. I hope they actually have a different monitor or a different proxy for end organ perfusion, but it's not really at that time uh, well defined in that study. So 20 to 30 percent drop from a baseline means, uh, okay, if you look at it, who have actually does monitor the baseline? And then there's the study from Auckland as the baseline isn't really recorded at all, less than 3 percent. Okay, the time of the, when we take the first blood pressure after induction anesthesia varies as well. A lot of people start very late. Oh, by the way, oh, it's 20 minutes. Oh, we better sh should do a blood pressure. I think we could be much better and can do much, much earlier than that. Okay, other pitfalls in non-invasive blood pressure management is when uh, we should do it. Again, I've mentioned that to you before. We should do it as soon as possible. We should really have a pre-op value established to see where, where the baseline is. We have some sort of guidance for it. Where, which limbs do we do? Does it make a difference? Uh, and I come back to the second. And how do we manage? I can come to this one. So, does it matter where we man monitor? Actually, it's all over the place. If you really man monitor each individual limb, you get a different number every single time. So, which one is the correct one? Well, take your pick. Maybe just write up the highest or the lowest. I don't know which one is the correct answer. Does it matter invasive, non invasive? Again, take your pick. And it, just to illustrate this picture, here's a, a slide of my um, pediatric uh, cardiac anesthesia friend. So this is the right arm, 35 map. This is the right radial, that is 44, it's 10 higher. I, and this is the aortic arch, 48. So you have a 30% difference between a thing and the same time simultaneously. So which one is a high blood pressure? Does it really matter? Again, I bring it back to you. What matters really is oxygen delivery and organ perfusion. That's what you want to achieve. So, and if you want to measure it quite clearly, this is not how you do this one, but you have to really follow the recommendations for non invasive blood pressure me measurements with the, uh, with the correct uh, blood size, with the uh, position, as well as um, in an in a, uh, appropriate setting. So, 
going back to the case, so the two-month-old baby boy, positive family history, a bit of an auto uh, gradient, and again, blood pressure falling down. So what happened? Well, not everything ends well. And so fluid bolus, 20 mils per kilo, no effect. Okay, now it's starting to be tachycardic. The ECG looks a bit funny. And uh, progressively bradycardic, well, we better do something about it. Epinephrine, one mic per kilo, 10 mic per kilo. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, cardiac arrest, CPR, one hour. And dead. And the postmortem. Um, then showed an unrecognized Williams syndrome, and effectively that could have been uh, put back to the uh, positive family history. That actually this child had a sibling had exactly the same, so there's a genetic comp component to it. So this child was done in a secondary, again, it wasn't mine, a secondary uh, tertiary center where it was undiagnosed and wasn't really taken as serious as, as a great concern. So, was there something we could have done better? And I think that's always what we need to consider. And I would like to bring you something um, what is uh, very, very important and very close to my heart. It's about the institutional, uh, institutional competence. We need to really make sure that the child gets the best service appropriate where it should be done. So we need to really look at the who, where, what, when, and how and how we actually really maintain this is the how, uh, and the safe thoughts is all um, illustrated down there, how we maintain the physiologic hemostasis, which is actually really the key of the safe conduct of anesthesia all the time, and gives you some sort of idea for it. Again, I would encourage you to go to a website. This uh, is a live one. Uh, you see some podcasts. You hear some pediatric cardiac anesthetists elaborating on hypertension, for example. is very, very interesting to listen to. And it uh, gives you some idea of what you really should look out for. So as a take away message, as I said, I don't really have nightmares. I'll try to treat it at, um, as best as I can. And, uh, and not a pediatric anesthetist. But if it really comes down to the final thing, what really gives would give me a nightmare where I really step back and say, this is really uh, where I don't want to be involved, is uh, when you have a left ventricular outflow obstruction, like the Williams syndrome, or like hypostrophic uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy, severe super systemic uh, pulmonary hypertension, vascular stenosis, or if you are working in critical care areas, children with a sepsis, which is not treatable at all, doesn't respond to any process, any basic constriction, and when you have a problem, when you need to think how you can regulate your cerebral outer perfusion. This is the stuff that really makes me think twice and really think about physiology and try to address it appropriately. And at the I stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, uh, the uh, floor is open for questions. I do have a couple questions that have come up on this iPad. Um, this is for you, Nicola. Um, why did you not use high-flow nasal prongs to do an oral uh, intubation with a fiber optic? Why did you have to do it with the mask? Okay, this is a nice question, which led me addressing the use of oxygen. So the dogma of using oxygen, whatever it is, high flow, low flow, is to have the airway patent. Since this child had obstructive sleep apnea syndrome with hypertrophic adenoids, I can assume that the upper eye were, were, were not patent, even uh, mechanically or physiologically. That's why we prefer to maintain the spontaneous breathing plus face mask ventilation rather than using high flow nasal cannula. This is good approach, but the airway must be patent, and this was not the case. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Aruna, this is a question for you. Can you rely on definitions in an acute bleeding patient? So do you wait until the child bleeds 40 ml per kilogram before you start the massive transfusion protocol? No, no, we don't. I mean, once you know a major vessel has been cut, immediately you have to get all the steps in place. This is just to have an idea that 
there is what is the definition of massive transfusion so for example there is going to be a loss of say around 200 ml of blood in this child then you don't call it a massive transfusion in a 20 kg child say it's 400 ml this is to define the problem you need to know you need to know the definition of what a massive transfusion is and that is a weight based guideline so you don't have to wait once you have a major vessel that is cut you start all the steps immediately you don't wa wait for a particular number So in your case particularly this was a laparoscopic approach right laparoscopic approach so did they have to open they had to open it okay because that's the other thing where there's hesitation among surgeons sometimes where they somehow think that they can get through and i don't know i mean we have to impress upon them that it's critical that they open because they are not going to be be able to contain the bleeding yes right? that's definitely true sir because yeah. sometimes you really they need convincing to open up because right. they feel opening up is 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 like a failure on their part or something exactly exactly thomas so you mentioned blood pressure is not very reliable parameter then how do you ensure adequate oxygenation and organ perfusion in infants yeah and that's that's actually a very good question and uh, that is something that we actually rely on measuring the blood pressure Me measuring the blood pressure as i try to give it to you is a is a very poor uh, proximity to organ perfusion however it's the best uh, as we have i mean you can i didn't have time to talk about nears and maybe you should really speak to cardiac anesthetists when you talk talk about nears and end organ perfusion and all the new toys are coming out there were other lunchtime symposiums today that will give you new tools that you need to do ultimately i think the most important thing is that you need to actually be a doctor right you need to look at the patient as a whole you need to assess uh, go back to basics is the patient well perfused does it does is the capillary refill the same does he is he been oxygenated does the whole picture uh, that you see from your monitor from your experience fit with the current clinical state and if not why not and then you uh, you address this one so what i would try to do is i try to take you away from being fixated it has to be this particular pressure it has to be for this particular amount. because there's a huge inter uh, um individual variability that you can't really do so you actually need to use your clinical acumen and try to be as close to the normality as you can and as i said normal physiological hemostasis i think that's what you need to achieve and that is not just related to blood pressure but it, it gets to the all other uh, aspects of the 10n that i put you up from the safe dots uh, initiative look at the patient as a whole and as i say behave and treat the patient as your own as uh, and behave like a doctor thank you nicola here's a question for you uh, do you have some tips for the occasional pediatric anesthetist regarding fiber optic intubation especially for managing secretions and topicalization um good question so probably the tip is of course you have to familiarize with the equipment this is really important so if if you don't use fiber optic on a regular basis it's better you find a way to improve your expertise Uh, Thomas Riva mentioned the, the lab or the mannequin. This could be one option. Maybe the non very difficult cases could be managed with the uh, fiber optic. So be familiar with instruments. This is crucial. This is crucial. And of course, whenever you perform a fiber optic intubation with a child in spontaneous breathing, you need to balance uh, the sedative uh, um, administration. So awake in a child, well, if it is a neonate with a severe upper airway obstruction like a Rob, a Pierre Robin syndrome, then you can probably insert your LMA in a awake child. But if the child is, is older, like 80 year old, like the child we presented, uh, then it might be tricky to convince him to have a, an awake intubation. Then you can balance between sedatives and spontaneous breathing. And in all these pictures, topicalization so you have to use vasoconstrictors and topical anesthesia with the lidocaine these are also critical to make your uh, fiber optic intubation successful so i'm going to ask you an addendum to that question so two things number one this day and age there's a lot of aerosolization that is used for topicalization 
right? In the good old days, we used to squirt these things. We don't do that. The, the other concern that I have is the occasional pediatric anesthesiologist who's confronted with this, you know, I mean, it's a routine tonsillectomy that they're taking care of. What do you do? So, so the medical history and the physical examination of these children is important. So if you are an occasional pediatric anesthetist, don't do complex cases. So this is an alert. So refer to a um, central hospital where there is enough expertise, equipment, all this stuff to perform uh, the routine, the, the non-routine cases. So the very complex. Don't challenge yourself with a very complex case. This is the first. Yeah, go on. Uh, what is your experience in, with the dexmedetomidin as a sedation for uh, fiber optic? So it, it, it's, it's, it's a good medication. We, we use quite a lot dex. Of course, uh, by itself is not enough. So you need to have something else, probably small doses of opioids. Uh, it can be added with propofol in small doses. And of course, all these sedatives must be accompanied by topical anesthesia. So the combination of the two techniques is mandatory. So don't forget one of the two. So Nicola, following up on that again, in my younger days, when I first started in anesthesia, we always said, if you have a difficult airway, do a mask induction. Mm -hmm. Now the pendulum has swung. There's hardly any mask induction in these patients, and most people go with IV induction. So, your uh, comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I love this this comment because I mean I, I think there is no magic bullet for all these kids. The face mask inhalation induction is always a gold standard in pediatric anesthesia. Um, of course. If you can have an IV in place in complex cases, especially if you have a trapezoid, so most of these children might have syndromes and might have difficult to have an IV access. So if you have had well in advance an IV access, makes you more comfortable. But I, I, never, I, I cannot say that one of the two techniques is the best. I think you have to balance. Face mask induction is always good, even in complex cases. If you have an IV and you can start with intravenous, then you can perform like sedation with dexmedetomidin, small doses of, um, of propofol. So don't, don't think that one is good and the other one is bad. There is no good and bad. You, can, you have to adapt the induction to your child and your expertise. So no magic rules. Thank you. One last question. We have about a minute left for Thomas, because I think this might be helpful for the audience. Regarding blood pressure, do you routinely use pressors in infants, and which one would you reach for first? Um, again, I, I treat the underlying problem. What is the problem? Is it if it's a blood uh, acute hemorrhage, like I uh, mentioned, I actually give blood. If it's a if it's a, if it's a volume problem, I give volume. If I use a presser, the first presser we we use is uh, phenylephrine epinephrine or um, uh, epinephrine as well. So any of those three to, to, to start with. But if you really have to choose and you have one available, I would always have the epinephrine drawn up because that's the one that I, that that's actually is endogenous and that's the one you should be familiar with. And that's the one that usually is, a, uh, is also good for bronchospasm and other things that you may come across, right? Excellent. One last one question. Lactate is always a problem, particularly with newborns. And you can do all the correction you want, but that lactate level always is high. How do you deal with that? Uh, older children, you have to target it less than four. No, you I don't understand. Have to, I'm talking about in the newborns. Near, in the newborn, you don't have to look at the lactate necessarily. If your perfusion is okay, otherwise, in terms of other features, your blood pressure is holding, the TEG is fine, hemoglobin is fine, fibrinogen is okay, then you can slow down, sir. Thank you all very much, and I appreciate your time here. Thank you for an excellent panel here. Thank you. Thank you very much.